Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 57 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We are recording this early on Sunday, September 18th, and I am in the driver's seat this week. I'm Donald Wine, a.k.a. Blazing DW on the DBR forums. Uh, with me, as usual, is my, uh, my counterparts in this, in this whole venture. First, out of Atlanta, we have Jason Evans. What's up, Jason? Not much, not much. My living room is full. Your living room is full. Let me bring in. Let me bring in the other guy. Uh, so, so we also have Sam Klein, aka Dev Eleven. Sam, where are you this week? I'm in Jason's living room. <laughs> oh my goodness! Where am I? Why am I not there? I don't know. Um, you should have. You should have come down for this momentous occasion. It's a I party. Have. We tapped a keg. Oh, see, and you now yeah, you got beer. That's not. Yeah. That's messed up. Cameron's drunk. He's like falling down the stairs. Thing, things got really weird really quickly. You know the rules of show and tell. You don't bring. St- you don't talk about show and tell unless you have something for the entire class. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. Next time, buddy. Next time. All right. Uh, so there. Okay, we got the two guys in Atlanta. I'm here in DC. Uh, we're gonna kick off with uh the game that we probably don't want to talk about, but we probably should talk about uh the Duke Northwestern football game last night. Um, Duke 24 to 14 uh defeat. Um, in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Jason. I, I know you watched almost all the game of that horrible game. Uh, give me your thoughts. I, I really thought this was a case of a game where um, I thought Duke looked like the better team, but all the key plays, and I mean all the key plays, just went Northwestern's way. I, I mean, other than I, we had we had one, you know, sort of key interception um, in our territory, but. Like, all our turnovers felt like just absolute killers. Um, uh, you know, we were horrible on third down. They were fairly decent on third down. Um, whenever you felt like there was a moment where you were like, oh, wait, this could be an important moment in the game, um, the play didn't go Duke's way. And and that's not a good way to, to win football. And, and, lo and, you know, lo and behold, we did not win the football game. Um, uh, I, I thought we we struggled again on the offensive line. Um, we averaged 3.4 yards per rush, um, and and it didn't feel like we we opened many big holes. Um, and it felt like we you know again we kind of went away from the from the rushing game fairly early. Jella Duncan and Sean Wilson combined for only 20 carries. That, that's that's just not that many. Daniel Jones had another 10 carries, but um, Duke has yet to figure out a way to make Daniel Jones into a running quarterback. The way Thomas Sirk was, uh, the way Parker Bame is, um, it, you know, it, it, it the, the offensive line has not been able to open holes. Um, they didn't do a great job protecting Daniel Jones. Um, and well, and looking at the stats, it doesn't look like Daniel Jones was much of a passing quarterback yesterday either. It took him 39 attempts to get 150 yards through the air. So I, I don't know if you're if you want to say that was attributed to the to the offensive line. Um, um, are you looking at the right game? Looking at Duke Northwestern from last year. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, he had 48 attempts and he got for 279 yards. Still, that, I mean, that's still not great, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. No, no. You're, you're, I, so your point, your point was correct, just, but I was like, it was just stats. Just seem it was wrong. just Thomas Sirk stats. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like I was saying, I, I just felt like the, the important moments didn't go well for Duke. And, and and the special teams disasters, um, the the botched the botched punt, um, where it just went through the punter's hands, and we ended up giving them the ball on the forty five instead of on our forty five instead of giving them the ball, you know, pinned in their territory, and they promptly, immediately, very next play, score the go ahead touchdown. I mean, that's a killer. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, the 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 place kicking game, uh, AJ Reed continues to look absolutely lost out there. He missed an extra point. They said it was something like first time at 168 or 162. I forget the number. It was 160 something consecutive extra points by Duke football. Probably 159 of them by Ross Martin. <laughs> um, but yeah, and uh, I, I mentioned in the outset that it was a 24 14 uh, defeat. It actually was 24 13 because I, I already had forgotten about the fact that we had blown that extra point. Yeah, and and we missed a field goal. Not not a particularly long one. Um, Reed is really, really, really struggling. And by the way, I, I want to really quickly mention about AJ Reed because I, I'm sure there are Duke fans just bashing on him, really wailing on the poor kid. He he's just a freshman. Um, this kid knows how to kick. Um, he was when he committed to Duke. He was considered one of the five best kickers in the country uh, in terms of recruiting. 
Um, uh, Duke was thrilled to get him. Um, and he's the kind of recruit that you want to get. We offered, he, he visited Duke, we offered, and like within three or four days, he committed. Now, it wasn't a high profile commit. It wasn't something where everyone was, you know, it wasn't like Jack Sears, the quarterback who just committed, where everyone was going gaga over it. Kickers aren't like that. People don't go crazy over kickers. But this was a very good recruit. There were a lot of teams after him. And the moment Duke offered, he accepted. And my bet is, He's going to figure it out. He's got something going on mentally, or maybe there's some little mechanic thing going on with him. Um, but I don't want us to get down on him. The, the kicking game, place kicking game, is just too important to to your success. And I, I think he's going to figure it out. And um, I, I hope he's going to figure it out. We need him to figure it out. Well, and and, and he is only a freshman. And yes, and I presume that the that and a true the, freshman, not even a redshirt right, freshman, a right? Friend. So I would imagine. I, I mean. The kids from Alabama, maybe maybe the game does move this quickly in high school football in Alabama, but yeah. I'm sure the game is moving faster, uh, and that and that those defenders are coming off the line a little quicker than they did when he was in high school. So he may be adjusting to that, and and like with a lot of aspects of this team, it's young and it's going to take time. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing with Jones. It's the same thing with with uh, Parker, perhaps um, a lot of the a lot of the guys in the offensive line. I know that in our in our season preview, Bob Green noted the experience of the offensive line, but it's young experience as opposed to old experience. So they don't have all the, all the old guys to lean on, even with the, you know, the, young, the, the experienced guys are less experienced than the previous experienced guys. Um, right. And so you, all those things kind of come together. Yeah. You have to also yeah. remember that, that Parker, that Parker Bain was probably going to, was thinking about starting. We had Tom Cert that was on his way back from injury and then re-aggravated his injury right before the season started. So Daniel Jones probably is not supposed to start the season. And as a redshirt freshman, that's a very important position. It's the most important position on the field, arguably, uh, as your quarterback. And it's in the hands of somebody who, uh, as of August, what, 5th or whatever, was not projected to start the season. So uh, that is a, that's a big step that you have to overcome. It's, he's really learning by fire right now. Um, and same with the kicking game. I mean, last year, um, our kicking game was responsible for a lot of our points. And now that's in the hands of a freshman, too, who – is just now learning the ropes. And I think it's going to take some time for these guys to let the game slow down and come to them and, and be, uh, be effective going forward. But I mean, if you're looking at the stats from this game, like the stats are pretty equal from uh, between Northwestern and Duke. It, I mean, we only had 10 fewer yards on the same number of plays. Uh, we, o- we only were like 30 or 40 yards off in passing. Uh, we had more rushing yards. We only had one, we had one more first down than Northwestern. And everything else was just kind of about the same. But like Jason said, those big plays, just backbreaking, uh, just like last week against Wake, like those big plays are the ones that really affected the momentum of the game. And I think that is where we're lacking uh, this year, as opposed to some of the games that we were pulling out last year. Yeah, well, and, and um, like look at third down. Um, Duke was 5 of 17 on third down. Um, and I think two of those conversions came late when the game was really over. At one point, I remember we, we were like three of thirteen or three of four. I think we were three of fourteen at one point. Um, we, uh, if you're interested, we were similarly bad last year against Northwestern because I was just looking at the. Oh statistics. yes, there you go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, to me, it just kept on coming back to. I would see a play and I'd go, "This is an important play," and we'd blow it. Um, and more, uh, and this happened last week as well. And, and I mentioned it in the podcast. And it is something that's really starting to, to trouble me. Um, you know, I, I, I joked, hearkening back to uh, the good old days at Duke um, that weren't really good old days at all for Duke football when we would make lots of mistakes. It just felt like uh, we, we, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't get out of our own way much of the time. Um, uh, there was a lot more of that this week. I mean, we got really lucky uh, late in the first half when Breon Borders you know, Northwestern went for a long field goal. I think it was 49 yards and it came up short, but Breon Borders ran into the kicker. And I mean, really took him out, not a five yard, but a 15 yard running into the kicker penalty. And Northwestern got to take another field goal. Now they they missed that one, but when they were lining up to take the second one, they close myself. These are the kind of plays that kill you. And I was sure they were going to make the field goal. We got lucky that they didn't, but The mere fact that we gave them that chance, that you gave them another shot at the field goal, 15 yards closer, and and there were other penalties. The penalties to me just uh, came at the most inopportune time almost every single time. Um, I'm sure it's driving David Cutcliffe crazy because the moment he arrived at Duke, 
These were the things that he fixed. These are the things that were no longer Duke football. Uh, but, you know, it's troubling this season to see it. And, and I think that um, the reality of, of the schedule that's coming up, and I know in a, a couple seconds I think we're going to touch on some of the things that are coming up for Duke, uh, combined with how we've performed so far against probably the easiest three-game stretch of our schedule, um, and we're only one and two, uh, we got to say it. it th- this feels like a rebuilding, not a reloading year for Duke. Um, it's unfortunate. I mean, we've been spoiled by what we've done the past four or five years. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, and we're still supporting the guys, and I'm, I'm still hoping they, they can turn this around because it's little mistakes that can be fixed in currently being one and two, and I think they could easily be three and zero oh if they'd made the right play on a couple key plays. And we, and we had an ejection yesterday, is that right, from the game? We did, yes. Yeah, and uh, it, I thought it was pretty, it was pretty bad. He, he definitely raised his shoulder into the receiver, and that was, it. That was by the way, I forget who it was that did it. Edwards, I think? No, was it Devon? It wasn't Devon Edwards. Uh, maybe not. No, I don't think it was. Um, Donald, who got ejected? Uh, I didn't see who got ejected. Um, <laughs> I, I hope it wasn't Edwards because that'd be, yeah. that'd be important next week. <laughs> no, it, was, it was not Devon Edwards. Um, but uh, so, so that play, and I know you guys didn't get to see the whole game. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm 90% sure Duke was only down seven points when that happened. Northwestern had a third. We may have been down 10, but it was still, there was enough time that the game was still in doubt. Um, they had a third and 10, uh, and, um, they, they missed the pass and one of our cornerbacks, I forget who it was or safety, um, raised his shoulder into the receiver and, and really it wasn't, it wasn't head hunting. It wasn't as, I mean, you see some really bad head hunting plays and this wasn't one of those, but it was bad enough that I was, I was clear that there was going to be a penalty and that he was going to get ejected and he did. Hey, Jason, um, and it gave Northwestern a first down. Yeah, it was, it was DeAndre Singleton that got ejected. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're right. Um, and, and given the way the rules are right now, uh, I'm not going to contest it. He absolutely deserved to get ejected. There's no question in my mind that he did. Um, because you got to protect those receivers coming across the middle. But it was a huge, that was one of those huge key plays. It kept Northwestern Drive alive. I forget whether they scored a touchdown or a field goal. But it was one of those moments where I went, this, this for sure says to me we're not going to win this game. And that was in the second half, correct? When it yeah, happened, yeah. Well, he, miss, he misses. Yeah, he misses. The, so he misses the first half of the, the game half. against Notre Dame. Yeah, it was in the fourth quarter, like maybe five minutes remaining, something like that. Okay, yeah. So he's out for the first half of the next game, which uh, is a pretty big blow for uh, our middle, uh, our middle defense um, next week uh, in South Bend, when we really, really going to need it. Um, even though Notre Dame is one and two, um, they are a quite good football team, and, and we are still kind of struggling. Uh, to learn who we are as a football team uh, this season. So, um, uh, Sam, any last thoughts before we move on? It's just going to be great when we shock the world next week and beat Notre Dame. Yeah. I would love that. That's going to be great. <laughs> um, yeah, that, 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 that's my final thoughts. I, I didn't get to see the game. I think we, we may have touched on this last week that I'm uh, obviously here in Atlanta this weekend, and I was at the Auburn-Texas A&M game yesterday. Uh, which was on about the same time as the Duke game. The Duke game started a little later, but I was driving back to Atlanta uh, after the Auburn game, and I do not have Big Ten Network on my phone. Um, So I was actually, unfortunately, not able to watch it yesterday. I'm sort of catching up today, and maybe I'll I'll, I'll torture myself and and watch the replay of the game just for my own knowledge, (laughs) but, but I can't guarantee that's going to happen. And with that loss, Duke moves to one and two on the season. And going forward, as Jason said, I think the the three easiest uh, games on the schedule are behind us, and we have a very difficult schedule going forward. Moving forward, we go to Notre Dame next week. Then we host UVA for homecoming. We host Army. We are at Louisville, which I know some of you guys watched that Louisville Florida State game. Uh, that's going to be an issue. Um, we have a bye week. Then we're at Georgia Tech, home against Virginia Tech and North Carolina. And then we finished the season at Pitt and at Miami, who have both improved uh, tremendously on, at, in the early season. So uh, I'll start with you, Sam. What are you seeing from the rest of the ACC that gives us hope going forward? The best thing about the schedule looking forward is that Duke has time to prepare for all of these teams and get better as the season goes along. Um, so Virginia is the, is the next actual conference game we have. We don't 
count Notre Dame, I guess, in the, in the conference games because they don't fall into the divisions and they don't get to play in the ACC championship, although they do get to take our bowl spots. Yeah, and, and, and it's worth noting, I mean, the game does count. It's on NBC, national television. And from a recruiting standpoint, God, I hope Duke fixes some of the mistakes we've made lately and we're able to stay competitive because if we stay competitive, it can undo, you know, some recruiting damage that could happen or already has happened. And my, my, I have a handful of friends and I who are going to that game, so we'll be doing our best to make Duke look great on national television <laughs> from the stands. So um, look out like for it. us. But, but yeah, so Notre Dame's going to be a tough game, obviously, although um, they've, they've fallen maybe a little bit in the last couple of weeks. They did lose to Michigan State yesterday, which is obviously not something you can be very upset about. But if you're nationally competitive the way that Notre Dame is, then, then that is upsetting. Um, following Notre Dame, Duke has Virginia, which should be easy. Uh, or should I say should be easy. We just lost to Wake in Northwestern. Um, Virginia is the way that Duke is this year. They lost to uh, Rick um, earlier, who's still an FCS school. And um, then following that, as you pointed out, Duke has Louisville, who uh, Army in between. Oh, Ar- Army and then Louisville. Army has had a has been has been, been kind of strong so far this year. Louisville is going to be a tough game. That's oh, we got to talk about Louisville. We got to talk about Louisville. That, I mean, you know, in years that, past, we we've <clears throat> this on the podcast before about how. Duke plays these juggernauts and sometimes gets just not is known for having the best recruits in the conference. They have some of the very best coaching in the conference. I mean, say what you will about their methods and, and, and how often their players are, are cheating at music class. Florida State, <laughs> Florida State wins football games. They win every year. They're always competitive with, with everybody. And they looked terrible against Louisville yesterday right from the start. I mean, it, the, the game was over in the second quarter. Yeah, how often is Florida State out of a game at halftime? Right. It, like, doesn't happen. It was 35-10 to 10 at halftime, and it, it felt like it could have been. I mean, Louisville hung 63 on them. If you told me at halftime Louisville was going to hang 70, 77 yeah. or more, I would not have been surprised. They looked utterly unstoppable. And I know that coming into the season, Louisville was supposed to be good, and the, and the talk was kind of, you know, Clemson and Florida State are 1-1A one one in the ACC, and, like, maybe Louisville will be able to, like, squeeze out a win against one of them. And all of a sudden, Lamar Jackson, I mean, early in the season, could be the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. There's no question he's the front yeah. runner for the Heisman I mean, right he, now. Yeah, it, it, he had the stage yesterday and totally took a hold of it. Um, and he's got more opportunities against good ACC teams and against Houston late in the season to, to think he's not going to do it. I mean, they've, they protect for him, and they, he, he can get out, he can run, he can pass. Every, that kid is, is as good of a quarterback as we, probably the best we've seen since Jameis Winston and could be better than Jameis Winston. Uh, as far as college production goes. So Duke has to play at, at Louisville on a Friday night. So a short week of preparation for prior to that game um, and then playing in their house, which was a nightmare for Florida State yesterday in a noon game. Um, that's going to be really tough. For Duke. And, and, and by the way, while we have a short week of preparation, Louisville does not. So Louisville plays Marshall next week. I don't know what the line on that game is, but if it's anything less than 50. It's a million. If it's less than 50, hop on Louisville. Then they play at Clemson, which is, you know, darn close to their game to reach the national. I mean, that's going to be the that's the ACC championship game and potentially the the play in game. For right, the playoffs. exactly. So they play at Clemson, and then they have a week off before they get Duke on Friday. So they get which they're going to need to recover from Clemson before right. they before they play exactly. Us. But I mean, oh my good, oh my goodness, they. I, I don't know what the line will be when they play. If they beat Clemson, if they put a beat down on Clemson, which is not. Unlikely at this point. Where is that game? That, that, it's in Clemson. It's, it's in Death Valley. You know, yeah. If they win by one, yeah. If they win by one, it's a big deal. But I mean, the line could be in the fifties. It really so could, want- and that's not because Duke isn't good. It's because Lu- Louisville's what Louisville's doing. Yeah. yeah. They, they. I mean, they. They team from a couple years ago that just rolled through. The- yeah. They're averaging 66 points a game. Yeah. They're averaging 65, 60, something like with that. With one game against Florida State. Yeah. With, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I watched all, um, basically the entire game yesterday, Louisville, Florida State. And early in the first half when they were up, it was 35 to 10 and a half. I really wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, this game is over because I watched the first half of that Florida State game against Ole Miss where I was saying, oh, this game is definitely over. And they ended somehow came back and won that game. It was the first, like, se- the first two plays, which was basically the first series that Louisville had in the third quarter, where I was like, okay, this is, this is a beatdown, 
and Florida State is not coming back from this because they just came out, and it's almost like they knew that too. They, it's almost like at halftime, the coaching staff went in and said, hey, remember that Florida State game against Ole Miss where they, everybody thought it was over and they came back and won? Go out there and tell them that this game is over, but that they're not coming back. And well, they just came out with a, with a storm in the, in the second half when, they probably, when most teams would have let off, the, let off the gas a little bit. But it was also my first time watching Lamar Jackson, and it's like in an entire game. And who boy, that, that boy is good. He is a tremendous player, and for some reason, he just has this swagger that, as you guys said, screams Heisman. Like, he, he's going to be in the thick of things for the entire year, in my opinion, because the fact that he can carry his team both with his arm and with his legs, and some of the, like, some of the, the, the runs that he had, even if he didn't score a touchdown, were backbreakers because you knew that Florida State was just like, well, we stopped him, but they spent all their energy stopping him, and they knew the next play was going to be a touchdown because – it took him to like the three yard line to actually pull him down. Um, and then there was that one where he just spun, just hit the circle button and spun around the entire defense uh, as he entered the end zone and posed as he entered the end zone. And that was one of those iconic like Heisman moments that when they do the uh, ceremony in December, they're going to show that highlight. No doubt. And if he's sitting uh, among that final three. And now we're going to move on into basketball, uh, and we're going to talk about something that in the history of Duke University basketball program has never happened, uh, and was going to happen twice in October. On October 19th and October 25th, Duke basketball will hold their first ever basketball pro days, and that is where you know we're going to have a lot of scouts coming in from the NBA uh, to practices, and Coach K is allowing them to view our team uh, in practice to see, you know, to kind of scout them out and, and give them some uh, feedback as to some of these guys' chances to make it at the next level. Um, it's something that Coach K has never allowed before. Um, it's something that uh, occurs on occasion with a lot of programs around the country, namely like Kentucky, Kansas, uh, and some of the other big programs. But Duke has always been very um, secretive and closed about their practices. Uh, so for this to open up, for Coach K to uh, allow scouts in to see his team before the season starts, uh, it's something that's pretty much unheard of um, uh, in, in around these parts. And is, like I said, a first for our program. Uh, I'll start with you, Sam. Like, what do you think of this? And what, what do you expect uh, uh, will come out of uh, these couple of pro days that we have next month? Hopefully it allows for the for the program. I get why they want to do it, because it it removes, I think, a lot of the distraction. I, I, I'm not sure if if you're correct, Donald, about them being closed all the time to the scouts, because I know and and. These two things may not be related. On the football side, there are scouts at every practice, or at almost every practice, NFL scouts at almost every practice, and they're kind of free to walk around and do whatever they want. I would imagine that basketball is the same way. Um, what's notable here is that they've limited that access to particular days when it's early in the season. They are still probably installing parts of, the, um, of their playbook, but more importantly, they can focus on doing the things that, that the guys want to do want to show off for the NBA scouts that may not get shown in the games, especially, you know, you might look at a, a player like Marquise Bolden, who may only play 15 minutes a game this year, but is expected to be a, a high NBA draft pick. He might not get the opportunity in big games this year to really show off the things that he wants to show scouts for the draft potentially next year. And this is a good way for the staff to say, listen, we're going we're gonna to have these practices in a way that showcases you guys. Um, you know, they might not run drills where, where the guys at the end of the bench get to play as much. Um, they, they might do more things that, that showcase the, the, the skills that are going to get the guys drafted. And frankly, it's a recruiting tool, right? It allows, it allows the incoming guys, that, the high school guys, to say, Duke, it, you know, because I think the rap on Duke for many years, and, and it's sort of fallen off, is that Duke doesn't get guys to the pros, or they, they prepare guys for playing the the Duke way and not in the professional way. And Coach K has obviously turned that narrative around a fair amount, but another way to combat it would be to um, say to the, to the prospects, listen, you're going to come here and you're going to play for our team and you're, we're trying to win championships and that's the goal. We also recognize that your, all of your ultimate career goals, any kid who's getting recruited to Duke wants to play professional basketball, wants to be in the best position possible when the draft comes. And this, this pro day thing that, that the staff has decided to engage in um, allows them to cover both of those 
uh, to to meet both of those goals and to be there for the for the kids because ultimately you know the the program wants to be able to serve their students uh, in a way that that fosters continual returns and and more so than ever because now that every guy who comes in is a top guy and expects to leave um, you have to be competitive in that way and and to be competitive with those kids you have to show that you're, you're going to showcase them I think it also probably takes some of the pressure off if they do have if they used to have NBA scouts regularly at their practices. Um, it takes some of the pressure off the guys to perform a little bit more in practice and to and and so they can focus a little more on who the upcoming opponents are and not about who's getting reps in practice, who's getting shots, there's only one ball, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hopefully it allows them to to focus on on the games at hand. And as you noted, these practices are both going to be in October. They're not late in the season. They're not during the ACC. They're not before Duke has big games against big opponents. So I think it's a good thing. People are obviously going to rip on it the same way that they rip on Kentucky doing it because um, it's showing a little bit. You know, it, it's a little, it's a little haughty. It's a little, um, oh well, well our guys are NBA guys, but we only want the exposure at certain times, and we're you know focused and yada yada. I think it's good for the program, and ultimately, it's not like any of the fans are going to notice the difference, right? I mean, we don't see the practices. Um, we don't hear much about the practices other than what Doris Burke might say offhand because she saw practice this week, you know, in her game commentary. Um, it's it's a minor story for the fans. It's a big deal for the recruits and not really for us. I, I want to point something out that I think is an important thing to note. Um, this is not for the NBA. This is not for the GMs. This is not for the scouts. Yes, they will be there, but they're going to have months of game film to watch on these guys. Before they decide to draft someone, they're going to bring that player in for an individual workout where he will work out against other similar kind of players. In June, not in, in October. Exactly. I was just, that was going to be my next point. Yeah. And it won't be, right, in October. It'll be, you know, in June after they've played a full college season and they've worked out with um, all these guys. You know, if, you, if you're a real draft prospect and the NBA is actually looking at you, you're going to hire a, you know, a specific coach who will work with you once you get done at Duke before the draft comes around. So to be very clear, this is not for the, not for the scouts. They'll be there, but this is going to be one fiftieth of their evaluation of these players. What this is about is Duke making it very, very, very clear to recruits that Duke is a place that it, that will prioritize getting you to the NBA, and that's fine. That's what Duke should do for players this caliber. These guys are coming to college because they're going to eventually play in the NBA and they want the best instruction and the best fit for preparing them for the NBA, both as basketball players and as individuals. And this is Duke saying, hey, this is another way that we do this for you. And I think that's an important message to them. And then the other audience for this is the current Duke team. And this is saying to the guys on the current Duke team, gentlemen, we're going to show you off to the NBA and then Put the NBA out of your mind. It is not about the NBA. It is about forming a Duke team, coming together, and performing as best we can as a team and having team goals. And I think that the last of the NBA workouts in late October will be the last time Coach K expects any of these guys to mention or think about the NBA until the college season is done. And, and I want uh, <coughs> any readers on the Duke Basketball Report forum uh, if you have some time to please go back a few years and see if you can find a Jason Evans post conflicting what he just said, because I am sure that seven or eight years ago, Jason <laughs> Evans was saying, um, well, you know, that, that it's not about going to the NBA. It's about being in college and, and someday they'll get to go to the NBA and then they could worry about it. Uh, <laughs> I'll, ta- I'll take a back. You, you may be right. <laughs> You may be right. I don't know. If, I don't know if it exists for sure. I'm just guessing based on the way that fans change their minds about things. Because I'm sure that I said the same thing, you know, back in 07, 08 time frame when none of our guys were getting. Drafted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 07, 08. I, I agree with you. Probably I would have thought differently. But I, I really feel that the college game has changed. Yeah. The, the nature of why these kids are coming to school has changed. Um, at, at least in terms of the expectation for how long they're going to be there and, and, and that kind of thing. I mean. Uh, it's a different world and and props to coach K for adapting to that world. And this is part of that ad- adaptation. Yeah. I, I think he's been the best. At- <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ripping on fans in general. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you don't, you don't get direct ire. You just happen to be sitting in front of me. 
Well, I think we've been the best at changing and adapting with the, as this rule has evolved because we probably, quite frankly, had the most to adapt to. You know, we weren't going after quote unquote players who were going to the to going to the league. We only had a couple guys who left early, not much less after their freshman year or sophomore year. Um, and so, even when those guys graduated or, or left, they were graduating before they left early. So we were in this kind of little like lane that we had, and we kind of had to prioritize, hey, if we're going to go after the best, which is what we do, the best now are staying for one year and going to the league. So uh, I think that is, when some people say, hey, you know, I hate we go after one and duns, I counter for, first of all, they're not one and duns until they actually leave. There's a bunch of players on our team right now who were considered one and duns when they came to college and they're still on, on in a Duke uniform. So you have that a- angle, but you also have the realization that you know, these players, that is their end goal is to get to the NBA. It's, it's just like any, you know, anyone else. We come to Duke University to learn and grow and eventually land a good job. Um, and so their good job is going to be one that's in the National Basketball Association. So I, I think that is and go ahead. I was going to say really quick, I want to take folks down history lane. I think it's very interesting to think about. So in 1999, um, Corey Maggette became the first Blue Devil to leave after his freshman year. And everyone was like, oh, my God, that doesn't happen at Duke. Guys, you know, they always stay for a little while. Um, and it was then, 2004, when Luol Deng became the second freshman to leave Duke. You guys know how long it took for us to get to the third one? 2012. 2011 was Kyrie. 2011 with Kyrie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is a very new phenomenon at Duke. And, and Sam, you know, Sam mentions, oh, go back and see what what Jason and other fans, other folks were posting in 2007, 2008. I mean, back then, freshmen didn't leave Duke. Josh McRoberts, number one recruit in the nation, stayed until his sophomore year. Freshmen did not leave Duke. Freshman Kyle Singler, top 10, yeah. top 10 recruit. Exactly. Didn't leave after his freshman year. Yeah. Didn't leave after his junior year. Maybe he should have. Right. <laughs> Although he's making plenty of money now. Although he's doing fine. Yeah, he's doing fine now. But, uh, but I think, I mean, this is... The, uh, we've talked about the adaptation. This is Duke has changed its attitude, but more than that, I think pro basketball, high school basketball, college basketball has changed its attitude. It used to be that you know you had to be truly, truly exceptional as a freshman to turn pro. Now it happens all the time. Um, it's really incredibly common. Um, and and before we wrap up in this subject, uh, as I've been doing my little historical lessons and looking at things, I got a great number to throw at you all um, from 2011 to 2016. A, fa- a six-year span, because I'm including 2011, Duke has had 13 players drafted by the NBA. Uh, you know, more than two a year. Uh, the NBA um, values Duke players. And that number, people, is going to jump by at least four and maybe five or six after this coming season. I agree. You're very, you're very high on Sean Obie's NBA prospects. I am. I am. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'll say Brankovic, man. He's going to stun everybody and go pro. He's going to dominate. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, once we get into the season, uh, you know, you hate to push guys out the door, but it may be kind of fun to sort of look at and think, uh, this Duke team, we really could have six draft picks in this team. And, and, and I'm sure we're going to be following it this year because yeah. – because- the media will be discussing it. Yeah. And yeah. we are obligated as sub members of the media <laughs> to talk about whatever, you know, all the NBA guys are talking about. Yeah. That's I mean, they're the nicest thing you've ever said about us, Sam. I appreciate that. <laughs> sub members of the media. That, I, I need to put that on a business card. That's, <laughs> that's my new <laughs> title. On my Twitter handle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to move on to parting shots, and I will start with you, Jason. So, um, you know, we've been talking about freshmen and talking about guys leaving for the NBA, and, and obviously one of the things that it necessitates is reload, 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 year after year after year. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to point out to folks, if you don't follow recruiting closely, um, two of the most valuable recruits to Duke, uh, Gary Trent Jr. and Wendell Carter, um, who are two of the top 10 recruits in the country, uh, guys who um, many, many, many of the recruiting experts expect to go to Duke. They both announced where they're going to be spending some of their time in October, and they are going to be coming to Duke together on October 21st, I believe is the date, for Countdown to Craziness. Um, uh, they're, they're taking visits to other schools at other times. 
Their visit to Duke, A, is together, and everyone keeps saying that these guys are probably a package deal. Package deal. Package deal, yep. We've seen that before at Duke. Um, So they're coming to Duke together, and they're coming for a day when it's going to be kind of raucous and crazy and really fun. Um, I I think this is a a really, really great sign for, uh, for Duke's chance of landing both of them. Again, they keep on saying that they want to play together at the same place. They're there are not many places that they are considering that are the same school, um, and uh, and and they are likely to be two of the early dominoes in um, in what will likely be the best recruiting class in the country. At least that's what a lot of folks are projecting. It hasn't happened yet, but I was very encouraged to see that the two of them are coming to Duke on a day when the Duke basketball team will be playing and Cameron will be packed and full and fun. So. If you're listening, Gary Trent Jr. and Wendell Carter, come on down. Shouldn't you be shouting for Wendell Carter? Doesn't he? Yeah, he he he. Actually, he doesn't live that close. He goes to school about about two and a half or three miles from where we are right now. He actually plays basketball. One of the guys on his team is one of the best friends of my son. So I got I got the ends with Wendell Carter. Jason's like an insider basketball player. (laughs) Uh, Sam, your your parting shot. Uh, so I uh, told Jason before we start, I told both of you before we started that my parting shot was going to be about the John Shire offseason podcast, but I realized that I had something more important to share. So uh, the following is my brief essay on the hubris of man <laughs> as, it, as it pertains to uh, our, uh, our, our planning of this recording. So on Friday, today's Sunday, on Friday, I was talking to Jason and, and to Donald to a lesser extent about when we were going to record and what, the, what our schedule was going to be. And Jason said, oh, well, we're going to be, uh, my friends and I are playing, in a, are playing a pickup basketball game on Sunday. Would you like to join us? And I said, sure. So we were, going to, we were going to record the podcast after we had the ball game. But I said with the caveat that, um, that I was going to be at an SEC football game on Saturday and I would be uh, consuming adult beverages most of the day. Um, <laughs> And uh, and that, you know, perhaps I might not be able to play basketball in the morning. And, you know, I'll, I'll check in Saturday afternoon. So Saturday afternoon, I, I was on the phone with Jason and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Um, I'm going to be fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of taking it easy. And Jason said, well, you know, my, my ankle might be hurting, um, so I'm not sure I'll play basketball. When we went to bed last night, the, the consensus was Jason ankles feel, Jason's ankle is feeling fine and I'm going to be fine in the morning um, to play. This morning I wake up, Jason has texted me that his ankle is not feeling well and he's not going to be able to ball today. Meanwhile, at 8 a.m. I woke up and I felt like total garbage. Um, <laughs> if I had been out on the basketball this morning, I would have fallen directly over myself. So the hubris of man is such that sometimes we think more, no matter what age we are, we think more of our physical capabilities than we perhaps have. But we both made it to the microphone this morning to record. So apparently doing the podcast is easier than playing ball. It, it just shows that my lungs and my vocal capacity has not diminished with age, but my ankles have. And, and my assessment of my drinking ability <laughs> is that it's not what it was in college. Sounds like I missed a weekend in Atlanta slash uh, Auburn. Uh, I was at a wedding yesterday, so I, I, I joined uh, Sam vicariously in drinking many beverages uh, of the adult variety but uh, i i i felt fine though i actually left that wedding early so we could drive back it was on the eastern shore of maryland uh and drove back so i could get up this morning uh, i actually slept in which was great so thank you guys for not playing basketball today <laughs> but uh my parting shot is uh w- last week we talked about the ncaa moving uh a lot of events out of the state of north carolina and the day after we recorded um, the ACC filed suit and moving a lot of the neutral site uh, championship games out of the state of North Carolina, including the ACC championship game in football. Um, that game was supposed to be on uh, fe- uh, December 3rd, um, but, and it was supposed to be in Charlotte, but we don't know where it's going to be. Uh, just checking the schedule uh, for the NFL, the one team, the one place that people would, would say, hey, it'd probably be easy to put it there is Atlanta, but of course, the SEC championship game is slated for Atlanta, and they have a Falcons home game probably like 12 hours after the conclusion of the SEC championship game, depending on when that starts. Uh, there's only three or four venues that make sense, or five venues actually, that make sense 
uh, for ACC country and as an NFL stadium that is free that weekend. That is FedEx Field in D.C., Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm, I'm calling it Dolphin Stadium because that's what I call it in Miami. You MetLife in New York. Do you know what it's called this year? It is called the Hard Rock Stadium now. Did you look that up or did you know? No, I knew that because my, the, the Hurricanes play there. Um, yeah, so the, I, I, I still call it Dolphins. <laughs> and he didn't know. Um, yeah. So it, it'd, be, it'd be totally fine if you didn't know. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's Hard Rock now. It was Sunlight before, before that. It was Landshark before that. It was Pro Dolphin Player. Stadium. Then it was Dolphins Stadium. Uh, and then Pro Player and then Joe Robbie. But I have a Dolphin Stadium because that's what it was when I was down there. And that's basically what it is. Uh, and then Tampa, um, uh, Raymond James Stadium is also a free stadium. Um, MetLife is actually hosting Monday Night Football, but if there's a game on Saturday, you would think there's a, a quick turnaround, um, and that would be enough for them to uh, change everything around. But it's going to be interesting to see where the ACC actually lands this thing. Um, and, and I think the, the timing of the, uh, of the announcement was so that they can make these plans, and it's going to be interesting to see probably over the next week or two um, where they decide to have this game, or if they decide to just play it at a neutral site that is a ACC stadium that, that's big enough, like Florida State, uh, or Death Valley that has uh, 80,000 seats. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what that is, and I think that's going to be something that maybe Duke fans aren't necessarily worried about at this time, given our record, but it's going to be something that the ACC will probably look out for uh, going forward. Wait, 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 wait. Are you saying we're not going to run off seven ACC wins in a row? No, because I'm saying right now we're not worried about it, but later on we will be because, I mean, obviously they're doing this because they knew we were going to run the table and they didn't want to give us a straight at home game in Charlotte. So they're going to move it somewhere, probably Anchorage, uh, so that we don't have that issue. I don't know why they don't just honor the um, 1942 Rose Bowl and uh, play the game at Wallace Wade Stadium. There you go, baby. I'm, I'm the, the, new, the new wall. The new wall. The new but I think that's going to do it for the Duke Basketball Report podcast, episode 57. Uh, remember, you can find us on the forums at DukeBasketballReport.com. You can also find us on Stitcher Radio, on iTunes, and on SoundCloud. Uh, you guys down there in Atlanta, uh, for Jason and Sam, I'm Donald. Uh, thank you guys very much. We'll see you next week. Duke Band, take us out. Let me give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B-O-D-I.com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I.com.